My entire life's been spent only in one industry, which is this one. And uh, but I've been in it now for about 15 years, and I've seen a lot of people make a lot of things. I've seen a lot of people fail a lot of things. And my my point of view on this, or my observation is, that the doers are the major thinkers. Uh, the people that really create the things that change this industry are both the thinker doer in one person. And if we really go back and we examine, uh, you know, did did Leonardo have a guy off to the side that was thinking five years out in the future what he would paint or the technology he would use to paint it? Of course not. Leonardo was the artist, but he also mixed all his own paints. He also was a, a fairly good chemist, knew about pigments, uh, knew about human anatomy, and combining all of those skills together. The art and the science, the thinking and the doing, was what resulted in the exceptional result. And there is no difference in our industry. The people that have really made the contributions have been the thinkers and the doers. A lot of people, of course, it's it's very easy to take credit for the thinking. Uh, the doing is more concrete. But somebody, it's very easy for somebody to say, "Oh, I thought of this three years ago." But uh, usually, when you dig a little deeper, you find that the people that really did it. We're also the people that really work through the hard intellectual problems as well. We try to hire really smart people, but we have a very simple organization,、mm -hmm. and we try to focus and do very few things well. And focusing is hard because focusing doesn't mean saying yes; it means saying no. So we say we we decide not to do a lot of things, so we can focus on、oh. a few handfuls of things and do them well. And、um, I think.、Uh, You know, everybody working at a company wants to do something great.、Mm -hmm. They want to be excited about what they're working on,、mm -hmm. and、uh, and they want to be recognized for it、uh, when if they do a really great job. So we just try to allow people to do the best work of their lives at Apple and get it out to 25 million customers that we have,、mm -hmm. and that's very exciting. And when you're working on something, and you know, if this works out, up to 25 million people are going to use this. It's very motivating.、Mm. You know? And it's not just 25 million of our customers, but、uh, other companies tend to follow us. You know, it takes them a few years, but other companies tend to copy what we do if it works,、right. and、uh, and so we can influence the whole industry. When I was a young kid,、um, there was a、um, a widowed man that lived up the street. And、uh, he was in his 80s.、Uh, he's a little scary looking, and and I got to know him a little bit.、Um, I think he might have paid me to cut his mow his lawn or something. And one day he said, "Come on into my garage. I want to show you something." And he pulled out this dusty old rock tumbler. It was a, a motor and a, and a and a coffee can and a little you know band between them. And and he said, "Come on with me." We went out to the back and we got some just some rocks, some regular old ugly rocks. And, he, and we put them in the can with a little bit of,、uh, of liquid and a little bit of, uh, of uh, grit powder, and、um, we closed the can up. And, and he turned this motor on. He said, "Come back tomorrow." And his can was making a you know a racket as the stones went around. And I came back the next day, and we took we opened the can, and we took out these amazingly beautiful polished rocks.、Um, The same common stones that had gone in through rubbing against each other like this, creating a little bit of friction, creating a little bit of noise, had come out these beautiful polished rocks. And that's always been in my mind my metaphor for a team working really hard on something they're passionate about is is that it's through the team, through that group of incredibly talented people. Bumping up against each other, having arguments, having fights sometimes, making some noise, and working together, they polish each other, and they polish the ideas. And what comes out are these really beautiful stones.、Yeah. So it's hard to explain,、um, and it's certainly not the result of one person. I mean, people like symbols, so I'm the symbol of certain things. But it really is, it was a team effort on the Mac. One of the things that really hurt Apple was after I left, John Scully got a very serious disease, and that disease—I've seen other people get it too. It's、um, 
It's the disease of thinking that a really great idea is 90% of the work. And that if you just tell your, all these other people, you know, here's this great idea, then of course they can go off and make it happen. And the problem with that is, is that there's a, just a tremendous amount of craftsmanship in, in between a great idea and a great product. And as you evolve that great idea, it changes and grows. It never comes out like it starts because you learn a lot more as you get into the subtleties of it. And you also find there's tremendous trade-offs that you have to make. I mean, you know, there are, there are just certain things you, you can't make electrons do. There are certain things you can't make plastic do or glass do. And, and, and as you get into, or factories do, or robots do. And as you get into all these things, designing a product is keeping 5,000 things in your brain, these concepts, and fit, fitting them all together in, in, in kind of continuing to push to fit them together in new and different ways to get what you want. And every day you discover something new that is a new problem or a new opportunity to fit these things together a little differently. And it's that process that is the magic. There needs to be someone who is sort of the um, keeper and reiterator of the vision. Uh, because there's just a ton of work to do and a lot of times you know when you have to walk a thousand miles and you take the first step it looks like a long ways and it really helps if there's someone there saying well we're one step closer you know the, the goal definitely exists it's not just a mirage out there so in a thousand and one little and sometimes larger ways the vision needs to be reiterated I do that a lot and it'll all work itself out a lot of people come to me and they say, well, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I go, oh, that's great. What's your idea? And they go, well, I don't have one yet. And I say, well, I think you should go get a job as a busboy or something until you find something you're really passionate about because it's a lot of work. And I'm convinced that about half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. It is so hard. You pour so much of your life into this thing. There are such rough moments in time that most people give up. I don't blame them. I mean, it's really tough, and it consumes your life. I mean, if you're if you've got a family, and you're in the early days of a company, it's I can't imagine how one could do it. I'm sure it's it's been done, but it's rough. I mean, because it's a pretty much a, you know an 18 hour a day job, seven days a week for a while. So, unless you have a lot of passion about this, you're going to not survive. You're going to give it up. So you got to have an idea. A, and a, or a, a problem or a, a, a wrong that you want to write that you're passionate about. Otherwise, you're not going to have the perseverance to stick it through. And I think that's half the battle right there. Now that, that's why you need to do it young. Now that's why we started Apple. We said, you know, we have absolutely nothing to lose. I was 20 years old at the time. Waz was 24 or 5. So we, we have nothing to lose. I mean, we have no families, no children, uh, no houses. Waz had an old car. You know, I had a Volkswagen van. I mean, all, all we were going to lose is the, the, our cars and the shirts off our back. We had nothing to lose, and we had everything to gain. And we figured, even if we crash and burn and lose everything, the experience will have been worth 10 times the cost. So what did we have to lose? There was no risk. And that's, you know, I think that's a very healthy way to look at it. Um, some people say, well, you could have gone to college and been a lawyer. Well, you're, you're right, but you can go to college and be a lawyer when you're 25. And there's nothing that stops you from doing that. You really, the only thing you really have in your life is time. And if you invest that time in yourself to have great experiences that are going to enrich you, then you can't possibly lose. So I always advise people, don't wait. Do something when you're young when you have nothing to lose, and keep that in mind. Um, and I, I think that's the best way. Not that people can't start companies when they're 50. I've seen that. Very successful companies. But um, it's a lot easier when you're uh, young and have nothing to lose and, and don't have the responsibilities to other people that you will acquire later on in your life. It's hard to remember how bad it was, you know, in 19, early 80s with IBM taking over the world with the PC, with DOS out there, 
it was it was far worse than the Apple II. And they tried to copy the Apple II, and they'd done a pretty bad job. And it, you needed to know a lot. And so things were kind of slipping backwards. And Macintosh was, you saw the 1984 commercial. You put the, I hope you have that in your archives. You know, Macintosh was basically this, uh, this relatively small company, you know, in Cupertino, California, taking on the Goliath, IBM, and saying, wait a minute, your way is wrong. This is not the way we want computers to go. This is not the legacy we want to leave. This is not what we want our kids to be learning. This is wrong, and we are going to show you the right way to do it. And here it is, it's called Macintosh, and this is so much better that it's going to beat you. And we are going to do it. And that's what Apple stood for. Things are packages of, of emphasis. Some things are emphasized in a product, some things are not done as well in a product, some things are chosen not to be done at all in a product. And so different people make different choices. And uh, if the market tells us we're making the wrong choices, we listen to the market. We're just, we're just people running this company. We're trying to make great products for people. And so we're, we have the, at least the courage of our convictions to say, we don't think this is part of what makes a great product. We're going to leave it out. Some people are going to not like that. They're going to call us names. It's not going to be in certain companies' vested interests that we do that, but we're going to take the heat because we want to make the best product in the world for customers. And we're going to instead focus our energy on these technologies, which we think are in their ascendancy and we think are going to be the right technologies for customers. And you know what? They're paying us to make those choices. That's what a lot of customers pay us to do, is to try to make the best products we can. And if we succeed, They'll buy them. And if we don't, they won't. It, I didn't know how to explain it then, but I've thought a lot about it since. If you, most things in life, the dynamic range between average and the best is at most two to one. Right? Like if you go to New York City and you get an average taxi cab driver versus the best taxi cab driver, you know, you're probably going to get to your destination with the best taxi cab maybe. 30% faster. You know, in an automobile, what's the difference between an average and the best? Maybe, I don't know, 20%? Uh, the best CD player and an average CD player? I don't know, 20%? So two to one is a big, big dynamic range in, in most of life. Um, in software, and it used to be the case in hardware too, the difference between average and the best is 50 to one, maybe 100 to one. Easy. Okay. I've very few things in life are like this, but what I was lucky enough to spend my life in is like this. And so I've built a lot of my success off finding these truly gifted people and not settling for B and C players, but really going for the A players. And I found something. I found that when you get enough A players together, when you go to, through the incredible work to find you know, five of these A players, they really like working with each other because they, they've never had a chance to do that before. And they don't want to work with B and C players, and so it becomes self-policing, and they only want to hire more A players. And so you build up these pockets of A players, and it propagates. And that's what the Mac team was like. They were all A players. and. Um, these were extraordinarily talented people. When we were building our Apple Ones in the garage, we knew exactly what they cost. Uh, when we got into a factory in the Apple II days, um, the accounting had this notion of a standard cost. where you'd kind of set a standard cost and then at the end of a quarter you'd adjust it with a variance. And I kept asking, well, why do we do this? And the answer was, well, that's just the way it's done. And, and after about six months of digging into this, what I realized was the reason you do it is because you don't really have good enough controls to know how much it costs. So you guess, and then you fix your guess at the end of the quarter. And the reason you don't know how much it costs is because your information systems aren't good enough. So. But nobody said it that way. And so later on, when we designed this automated factory for Macintosh, we were able to get rid of a lot of these antiquated concepts. 
and know exactly what something cost to the second. Um, so in business, a lot of things are, I, I call it folklore. They're done because they were done yesterday and the day before. And so what that means is, is if you're willing to sort of ask a lot of questions and think about things and work really hard, you, you can learn business pretty fast. It's not the hard, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science, no.